Hello. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, I'm good. Move you. You would well, love this hair. It's beautiful. Thanks. Your vacation hair don't care. Oh, how is Hawaii? It was wonderful. You deserve it. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that hopefully while we, we chat today. Hey, it looks like my friend Kaya joined us. Hi Kaya. Um, so I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, you know, I did my first one of these with Jason last week and that was fun. <laughs> yeah. And it seems that people are really excited about um, this kind of uh, platform for us. So we'll be doing this more. So I'm, I'm really excited that you're here. So we're just going to yeah. for a couple other people, hopefully, to arrive. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Happy to spend this time with you. Yeah, always good to spend time with you. Um, and while we're waiting, I want to give a, a shout out to all of the mental health professionals in the world who are doing the work. Um, it's a tough time for a lot of people. Um, for me personally, for other people that I know I care about, and we could not be having a more um, apt conversation for the types of abuse that we're starting to see a lot more now, unfortunately. Um, so I'm going to shout out to Dr. Prem, uh, Dr. Anel Prem, who got me to you um, because of the, uh, the Black Mental Health Alliance, of which yeah. you're the president. Um, my own is Dr. Catherine Meiselik, and um, Ladish and Eve Lunsford. These are just people that I know personally who've helped me on my journey, including you. So thank you for that. Um, I just think it's a really important time for us to be uh, uplifting the people who do the heavy work of carrying our burdens when they have their own. So definitely. Yes. That. And I, was, I was so excited that you were like on your way to Hawaii when I sent you that text message. I'm like, that's so great. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, you weren't the only one who was excited that I was on my way to Hawaii. <laughs> I, too, was excited about being on my way to Hawaii. Yeah, you were like the fourth person within two weeks that I know had gone to Hawaii. And I was like, oh, what kind of life am I living? I need to do better here. <laughs> <laughs> so I also wanted to point out my sweatshirt. So I want you to see what it says. Mm. Mental. Oh, okay. I love it. Right? Suppose we did uh, college and high school in addition to all the other clubs we were doing. So mm -hmm. I really not in the frame. So I'm going to give this sweatshirt a little shout out before we get started. Um, but anyway, um, thank you for being here. I'm just going to get started when people kind of add in, they will, I know you have, and you have clients to see, so I, I want to make the best use of your time. I want to welcome everybody to Amplify America's IG live on emotional and psychological abuse. Thank you so much for being here. I'm April Barrett, and I'm the founder and president of Amplify America, which is a movement that, um, people and issues how those issues affect other folks and the people working to find solutions to those issues. And uh, we are gonna be talking to a variety of people from across the country who are in their communities, who are dedicated to finding solutions to issues that matter to all of us and are excited about getting you involved in solutions. So thank you so much for being a part of this journey. Sure. I hope that you are here or when you come back around to this video after you've had you know, your da daily round, that you're here because you're an amplifier. You are someone who is interested in making a difference in your community through action and through a diligent commitment to sustainable change. Um, it's really important to me that in the work that we do, these conversations that I'll have on IG Live will be a lot more informal. Um, the podcast, however, will be a lot more intellectual, a lot more academic. Um, it is education and not entertainment. <laughs> so if you want a little bit more flavor, color, personality, you come here. But for the show, I want to kind of manage expectations. I really do want you to kind of focus in on your critical thinking skills um, to engage issues in a way where you're getting fact-based information, um, where you can apply it to your life or the lives of people that you care about, to your local communities, to this nation. Um, where you can gain some empathy, which is something I'm going to definitely be talking to Dr. Carter about today, because I think we're seeing some challenges with regard to empathy and compassion for things lately. Um, and then that empathy will allow you to have a greater curiosity about what is this work that people are doing? What are these experts talking about? How does that really affect people? So that's kind of what we're really about. And then there's always a call to action. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of our time together, too. So... I do hope that you listen to the podcast. The podcast was so full with so much information. 
I know a lot of you were like, oh, girl, that was a lot. I had to stop. I had to go back to it. I listened to Jason, then I, I went back to listen to Dr. Carter, but it is really, really rich. So if you haven't listened to it, I encourage you to go back. I also encourage you to share it with other people. Um, talk to other people about it and um, figure out how that feels for you, because this is one of those topics. If we really think about it, it's like the searing gas of all abuses. It's in the air all the time. We're totally ignoring it, but we know something right. It just this, it smells in here. What's going on? And you're slowly kind of being stifled because of it. So we're we're gonna really get into what that looks like, what that tastes like, what that feels like, and and how we can deal with it. So today, 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 I have the wonderful, lovely, and amazing Dr. Lakita Carter. She is a licensed psychologist and a trauma expert who was named one of this year's Maryland's Top 100 Women. She deserves this honor. I am so proud that she is in that sisterhood with me. She should have been there a long time ago, but I'm glad she's there now. <laughs> so congratulations on that again. She is also the CEO of the Institute for Healing LLC. It's located in Owings Mills, Maryland, and it's a wellness practice that specializes in treating people struggling with mental health and substance abuse problems. And that company was recently named the 28th largest minority owned business in the greater Baltimore area by the Baltimore Business Journal. So Dr. Carter is handling business. I'm so happy that she is here. Thank you for your witness for all of these things for so many reasons, but I'm, I'm excited that you are here, that you are giving your time when all of these things that you're responsible for are still on your plate. Um, I know you have a heart for giving back. Again, she's the vice president of the uh, Black Mental Health Alliance as well. I encourage you to, to visit her site, I Heal, um, and the Institute for Healing, LLC. We're gonna talk about social media handles and the things that she's doing at the end of this interview, but I want you to gain some curiosity about her and her work and also the things that she's doing in addition to her work to encourage people to understand mental health and the capacities we all need to build with regard to our education on that. So Dr. Carter, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. It's always good to share space uh -huh. and time with you. So I'm excited you too. to- you Good. Okay, so I know there are a lot of people here right now, but if you have questions, feel free to ask them as we go along. But I wanted to kind of navigate this a little bit based on some of the things that we talked about in our interview that didn't quite come to you all. But, um, you know, it was interesting because when I got to this topic of emotional and psychological abuse, I was like, all right, it's everywhere, right? It's, it's in our friendship circles, it's in our families, it's in our workplace environments, it's in our society. And yet I had a really hard time trying to get people to define what it was. If you look it up online, there's very scant information on it. So why do you think it's so misunderstood and what are the signs or the precursors that you want people to be aware of? Um, in addition to that, I want you to also give us an understanding of what does that feel like, right? Like, cause you know, I think a lot of times with mental health and we'll get into this a little bit later cause I'll tell you a little bit about my stuff that people don't kind of get what it's like. So I want you to talk about what the precursors and the signs are. What does it feel like in your body? Um, also in your brain and your body, but also like what are the mental health and physical health ailments that come along with that? So that people can start to say, oh, you know, I'm having this kind of mental health crisis with regards to emotional and psychological abuse. And this is the way that it's showing up so, so that it is identifiable. Yeah, you're right. So psychological and emotional abuse can be nebulous because, um, you know, there's a lot of times there aren't measurable behaviors. There's more of an impact without a measurable behavior. So you can clearly identify when you're partner has hit you twice today, right? That's measurable, it's specific. Sometimes there's even evidence of it, physical evidence of it on your body. And so that's a little bit easier for us to, to quantify and define and, and hold and take, take in in our brains. When it comes to emotional and psychological abuse, often well, you don't see the scars, right? So part of it is that it's a silent issue in that the only way that you can give it life is to speak it, right? Um, you don't have scars of it on your person. Um, you don't have lashes or cuts or bruises, but there is a bruise and there is a cut. 
uh, to the brain, to the psyche, to the, um, to the spirit of a person that can be quite deep. And so, um, you know, when you when you're younger, you I'm sure you heard in the 80s, it was a big turn, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Right. And um, and then in the 2000s, we sort of modified that sticks and stones may make, break my bones and words actually do hurt me. Hmm. So I think that speaks to um, to what to how nebulous the idea is that sticks and stones can certainly do physical harm, and yet words and, um, and ways in which you denigrate other people can do just as much harm, if not more, really. Um, because, stick, because oftentimes broken bones, or all the time, broken bones heal, right? Um, and so the bone is, is, is for, lack, for, for all intents and purposes, made whole after a period of time. Uh, now, how you got that bruise to your bone or break to your bone or bruise to your your psyche, that may not be healed. And that's where we, we see emotional abuse. The idea that someone can chip away at your self-esteem, at your self-value, your self-worth, um, can denigrate your your very presence, your the value that you put on yourself, that those that, that can be sort of chipped away at in ways that leave you empty empty or not as full as you could be or would have been without those that you know that interaction with that person or those people so what do we what does it look like and what does it feel like you know it often feels like confusion it can feel devastating or you can feel it can feel wounding um, one of the people that I spoke with yesterday said uh, she used the word to describe her experience was crushing. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's a great word to use to define, uh, define abuse um, in any way. And she was actually talking about abuse at a previous employ place of employment where she, her spirit was just crushed. Um, debilitating, crippling all those, you know, almost incapacitated. Like I said, you know, you can feel physically stopped. You can feel mentally stopped. Like I can't even respond because I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. I'm stuck in what just happened. Uh, it's akin to your body have it, give it, having a moment where there's been an infraction on your body and then there's sort of like a frozen moment where you have to take in mentally what just happened. Oh, I think a car just hit me, right? That's, that's what it's akin to, that your body sort of stops, takes in, and then responds. It's an emotional, it can be an emotional deer in headlights. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think people also just think it's in your head. They don't understand that the body keeps the score. So can you tell us a little bit also about what are the physical ailments that come along with this kind of abuse? Sure. Um, so the physical ailments may include, but every body is different, literally and figuratively. Everybody's different, but every body is different. So some physical ailments might be frequent headaches or migraines, GI problems. So upset stomach, bubbly stomach, nausea, vomiting, um, this sense of uneasiness, loss of appetite, um, difficulty sleeping or eating. And usually those are, are signs of, of anxiety. Like your anxiety has risen so high that it is, is impacting your ability to function daily. So re really anything, difficulty concentrating or focusing, uh, abuse raises our anxiety to the point where uh, at a certain point it will impact your ability to function in your daily life. And we don't, we certainly don't want that. That is when we are in, in the lane of disorder. Um, when we are, when we're not functioning as optimally as we can, when we can't take care of ourselves when we don't want to get up out of bed, um, when we are, you know, sort of stuck emotionally or even interpersonally, I uh, just can't sort of make the next move indecisiveness sometimes. Um, it can be, it can be very, very crushing debilitating yeah you know it's it's such a hard cycle to break um because it's a patterned behavior right 
It's something that happens over and over again. Um, so how do you break that cycle of that type of abuse? You know, and like you said, it's individually, it's within families, it's within friendship circles, it can be at your workplace, it could be, you know, within society at, at large, but how do you start to even consider unraveling that? So I like what you said there, it's a pattern of behavior, but I wanna be sure that we point out that it's a pattern of behavior for the perpetrator as well as the victim. So you are behaving in, in that moment. You are behaving in a pattern and the perpetrator is behaving in a pattern. So both of you are doing, are engaging in behaviors that are um, familiar to you. Your response is familiar to your perpetrator. Your perpetrator's response to you is often familiar, right? You know, okay, so if I do this, this might cause a reaction that is going to end up physical or that's going to end up in name calling or going to end up in, um, in a verbal lashing that I won't be able to navigate. In fact, sometimes in, in abusive relationships, you'll hear a person say, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't take that today. You know, I had a really hard day at work and I just needed to make sure we were, things were calm at home because I couldn't take another um, character assassination that lasted for an hour. I just couldn't today. Um, so your question was about patterns of behavior and how do we break them? Well, you know, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. So I think in part, anything that we do to change how we respond in those behavior. And I'm specifically speaking to survivors um, who, or people who currently are in abusive relationships of any sort or just got out of one, anything you can do to change the pattern changes the entire system. Um, so we say that in family therapy a lot, like when one person in the system changes, the whole system changes, it has to, right? Um, a very benign example to sort of um, give people an analogy is if you know your family has a way of working and and doing behaviors and let's say on one day particular day your oldest son is sick well that oldest son typically helps set to the dinner table that defaults to someone else that person takes out the trash that defaults to someone else. So when one person in the system changes, the entire system has to change. Similarly, when one step of a process changes, the process changes. Um, sometimes there aren't massive changes, right? We don't see huge changes, but there is a change. So anything that you can do to disrupt the pattern of how you respond is, um, is going to be an intervening moment. Maybe that's um, leaving the space maybe that's responding in advocacy, if that's a safe thing for you to do. Those are all kinds of calculations that people who are survivors have to make. How safe is it for me to respond here, right? But, but there are moments where it might be safer than others, like if there's another person in the room, um, or if something's, if it's being, if the interaction is being recorded, and then you also have to think about the after effects of those, of, you know, when you respond in that moment, is there going to be greater re retribution when you are alone? But any, but any, any difference in how you, you respond is going to be, is going to make a difference. It might not make a difference in the positive direction though, right? So sometimes you could infuriate your, you know, the perpetrator even more sometimes it might actually make a difference in the positive direction. I know you have, you know, in part of your story is about when you finally did make a change and responded, there was a much different reaction from your perpetrator. Right. You know, it's interesting because, you know, I, I think I want to take it a couple of steps back before we kind of get to the tools that you would typically give to people in the space, because when it's happening, I think it's really difficult for people who are abused to even articulate that. And I think you shaded that a little bit earlier. You were just like, okay, so it's happening to me and it's, and it's happening in these weird slight ways. Cause generally in these situations, people aren't just, they aren't doing it 24 seven. You might have a couple hours during the day where it's not. It's, so it doesn't seem like a pattern. It doesn't seem consistent. You might always be kind of walking on eggshells in those uncomfortable relationships and those unhealthy relationships. But 
because in the ecosystem that you inhabit, it is the norm, like you said, the abuser and the abused are kind of doing this dance with each other. Dance. They really know, if I do this, I'm going to get this. If I do this, yeah. he's going to do that. She's going to do that. So when it gets to the point where it's like, okay, I, I can't take this anymore. This is, I know this is a problem. You know, wh what is coming up for someone? And, and what would you advise people? Like, if they're in a situation where this is happening and they're stumbling and fumbling for words, they may or may not be in a situation where people can hear them. Not because they're unkind, but because it's really difficult for people to see emotional injuries in the same way that they see a broken leg. Right. So tell me, like, when you're working with a client and, and they have come to the, the realization, like, OK, I have to do something and I have to up in this ecosystem. I have to change how I interact in this space so that this behavior can change for me and I can get healthy. What tools are you starting to get them to think about to employ in these situations so that they can begin to change the dynamic to something healthier within that environment or to, unfortunately, if they have to depart that environment? So let me go back. I love what you said. It is a dance. Mm -hmm. our, we dance with our partners, whether you're friends, we dance with them, right? There's a, there's a dance that we do. Sometimes a dance is healthy. Sometimes it's not. Um, oftentimes when people are coming, they're not coming for that. Um, they're not coming for, you know, I think I'm in an abusive relationship. They're coming because I'm so anxious and I just can't control it anymore. Um, or I'm, you know, I am not sleeping. And the other day I fell asleep at a red light. Um, so it's not always that people are identifying what they're experiencing as abuse. Um, one of the most difficult sessions I had was when um, I listened to a survivor's story and, and confirmed for her that her husband had raped her. Um, and it was a moment where she just sort of sat back and when she finally was, when she was able to talk through her tears, she said, I thought so. Mm -hmm. It's not why she came in. Yeah. It's not why she came in. So um, I would say that, that the, I, don't, I don't get to tools right away because that's not usually what's, what's bringing people in. I'm, I'm assessing what their symptoms are. I'm asking about trauma. I always ask about trauma. Every mental health provider should be asking about trauma in their intake because it certainly colors um, the symptoms that are going on and it colors how you respond to patients. Certainly we wanna, our providers should be using trauma-informed care. I'd be happy to explain that to people a little bit later, but everybody should be working from a trauma-informed place and so if you're asking about trauma in your intake, that changes how you proceed. Even when asking about trauma, that always doesn't come up, right? A lot of times the answer is no, none of that. Even when I ask and then offer a list of possible traumas, none of that, right? So it doesn't, it takes a while. For some people, even the list doesn't, you know, my list isn't exhaustive, right? I have a, I have a time period. I have to get this, it, this, gather this information. So I'm not listing every trauma I can think of. I'm listing three or four traumas that are, are pretty common based on prevalence data and statistics, three or four that are pretty common. And so if they say no to that, then I, I move on to the next thing, knowing that in treatment, your life is connected. Every part of your life is connected to something is another, another part. So if we talk about work, at some point we might get to trauma. If we talk about your work in, in the community, at some point we might get to that house fire that you experienced when you were seven. I don't know how those things are connected. And sometimes the patient doesn't either. They just come out. Um, and so sometimes people don't mention trauma because they actually don't identify what they experienced as a trauma. Other times they don't mention it because they experienced the trauma, but they didn't experience a trauma reaction. Um, and, you know, they had, they, they, uh, some people are just more resilient than others. All of us have some level of resiliency, but uh, some people are more resilient than others. So sometimes, you know, they say, yes, I had that experience, 
but I'm I'm fine with that. I've moved on from that. I'm res I've resolved that I'm good with that. And then I keep that in the back of my head. Maybe it'll come back up. Maybe it won't. Um, but it's definitely something that that I I hold on to because what what a provider's idea of fine with something and what a patient's idea of fine with something maybe two different things. And the things that I know are signs that there may not be a resolution or may not be healing or recovery or may not be signs to a patient. So a patient may say, I'm coming in for anger and you know, I'm just so frustrated because um, I don't get any help from my partner around the house and with the kids. And then you know, there's some rape in their background and they haven't connected that the loss of of control that they have in home and in getting what they need out of their partner is the same loss of control that they had when they experienced a rape from a previous partner. Um, so those kind of connections are what, are what treatment really is about, helping you understand how your life is connected and make those associations, how one person might trigger your thoughts about another person. So those are some of the things that I use. I, I work a lot in helping you make connections um, and helping to heal the, tr the, your react, you know, change your trauma reactions, helping to heal you from trauma so that you can have a, a healthier existence, optimal health right now. The last thing I'll say about that is that when we say we resolve things, um, the analogy that I use is an addict. So when you live in a house I don't know how many people use addicts anymore, but I know my parents use an addict. I don't use my addict, but my parents use, use theirs. And our brains are like an addict in some ways. When things happen to us that we don't wanna deal with, we toss them in the attic and we toss them in the attic. So something happens and we toss it and we toss it and we keep tossing things in the attic. And what we haven't, um, what it hasn't occurred to us is that the attic doesn't have infinite amount of space. It has a very finite amount of space, right? And so the more and more that we toss things into the attic, it gets fuller and fuller. And then one day we come home and there's a bunch of stuff on the floor because the attic door has busted. And we're saying, how did this bust? Is there that much stuff up there? Really? I didn't know it was that. And then we start to look around. We can't dig through it because we can't walk through it. But we're looking around. Oh, oh, I forgot I put that up there. Oh, oh, wow, that was a long time ago. Why is that even still here? Why didn't I just throw that away? That's how we, what we do with trauma a lot. We toss them into the attic and we don't process them. And then they come back, they bust through. And the busting through usually looks like loss of sleep. I can't sleep. I can't get to sleep. I can't stay asleep. I can't function at work. I'm just sitting there looking at the screen. I am jumbling over my words. I don't want to be around people. I'm very edgy. I get irritated very often. I just want to go home and close the blinds. As soon as I finish work, I just go home, close the blinds, lay in bed, right? That's a sign that the attic is too full. And my job is to help you go through each part, each thing in that attic. And sometimes it doesn't mean that we throw away what's in the attic because we can't always. It's a part of our history. But what we can do is open it up, dust it out. We can look at it. We can notice it. We can talk about the memory that that piece, that thing holds, a blanket, a desk, whatever. We can talk about the memory that it holds. We can pick apart the things that are hurtful about that memory, helpful, funny, um, sad. And then we can fold it and put it back in a, in a neat place. That's sort of what trauma work looks like. It's not necessarily throwing away what's in the attic. It's going through the attic and figuring out, can, can we do enough work on this to throw it away? Or is it something that's gonna just stick with us and we have to fold it neatly after we look at it and, and analyze it and process it, all of that. You know, we talked about this before, um, but as someone who's done my own trauma work and, and, and will continue to do it until, um, it occurs to me that when you're going through this process on your own, there are other people that you're connected to who aren't going through that process with you. And, you know, they may not have an affection for your process. They may be triggered by your process. 
they may not have the capacity for your process, right? So, you know, in the spirit of full disclosure, I just had a new and, and very recent bout with my complex PTSD. It was very new to me. And um, it felt like my foot, no, my feet were on the gas and the brake at the same time. I was having a heart attack and there was an elephant on my chest. All of this was going on at once. And it was so interesting because in the midst of me having to go through that struggle that was exceedingly real to me, the, there are people who are around me who love and care for me very much who do not have that kind of acumen to understand it. Like if I had broken my leg, it would have been like, okay, she broke her leg, everybody rallied the troops. But like, it's really difficult to explain to people who don't have an understanding um, or the capacity to really get what it is like or to get into the, the understanding of what it's like for someone to be having sort of an emotional, mental challenge that is completely foreign to them. Mm -hmm. We had a conversation in our interview where we talked about how to hold the space for people who are dealing with this. And I think from someone who's trying to recover and survive it, um, one of the things that, you know, the people who were caring for me and who are still trying to care for me, and God bless all of you, the walks, the talks, the leaving me alone and checking in, even though I can't come back and check in with you, is deeply appreciated. But one, trying to figure out what is the language to share with them is difficult, especially if you're going through it and it's new to you. So you're trying to explain to them while you're having a heart attack that you're having a heart attack. So that was fun, right? <laughs> but the other part of it is just recognizing the different levels of you're on your journey, you're doing your work. That is important to you, so you're going to do it. There are a lot of people who will never go on that journey, don't want to go on it for themselves, don't want to go on it with you. They're not good, bad, right, or wrong. It's just what it is. But, you know, what, what would you say to people, because I think this is happening more and more now, you know, emotional and psychological abuse, I see pretty often. And we might say some of these cases are slight and it's not a big deal and we've been doing this for a generation and dad did this and grandpa did this and mom did this and all of these things, especially culturally, right? Where we kind of like throw it off like it's not a big deal and, and this is just what we do and get through it. But like you said, the attic is full, you know, and now it's running down into the common spaces. It's in your bedroom. It's in, you know, it's in the, dish, in the dining room. It's everywhere. It's in the next generation and the generation after that. It's just continuing. So I think my question is twofold. The first one is, what do you say to the people that you're working with to help them continue on their journey of healing, but also to help them navigate the spaces they have to occupy with people who are like, well, that's your journey. And, you know, I don't know how to deal with that. I may not ever want to deal with that. And, you know, what are you saying to them as far as how they start to navigate the world with those people? You know, this is a really tough one. This is really tough because your family has their own stuff going on, right? So on the one hand, you, you know, part of what family looks like is to help others through difficult moments. Every family is different in doing that. Sometimes help is sending a check, like take care of whatever you need. Here's a blank check. That's all, that's all I got for you. Right. Others, it's literally taking over your life, right? And doing everything possible that they can for you. And then there's a bunch of stuff in between. Right. It can be incredibly hard to be able to be there, to be there for someone when you have your own stuff going on. It can also create a, a, a rupture in your relationship, a fracture, a fracture. Like, okay, so if we're supposed to be sisters, how is it that when I'm going through this really difficult divorce that you aren't calling to check on me? I don't get it. Like, I just don't get it. And what's, what's hardest is that I think the vast majority of people, the vast majority, not everyone, the vast majority of people have to land on my sister's doing the best that she can right now. If I need more, sometimes I might have to say that um, because you don't know how you're seen in her eyes. So it could be that you're seen as the strong one. So the way that you helped me when I lost my baby is not the same way that I need to help you when you're ending your marriage. You're the strong one and you have a bunch of friends 
and you have a really great job. I lost a baby. I had no job and I have one friend. So you really did have to give me more help than I would ever need to give you. And then if that's the case, then that's something that you might have to say, nope, I need your help. I'm counting on you. And that can feel really uncomfortable for the person who's struggling, that I have to, I have to tell you what I need. Because you never had to tell me what, I, what you needed. I just jumped in. We're just not all built the same. You know, we're just not all built the same. And sometimes you're going to have to say it. And you can be, you can have feelings of sadness or resentment that I have to say, I have to tell you what I need. You can certainly experience those feelings. Those are valid feelings. If you need the help, though, you're still going to have to say it. Some yeah. people are just going to just yeah. going to pop up and other people are just not. And the people that you expect to pop up may not. And the people right. that you don't expect up may, may to, uh, expect to pop up may. But if you're looking for somebody to pop up and they haven't, uh, I think it warrants a conversation saying, I really expected to hear from you um, and I didn't. What's up with that? Mm -hmm. And depending on how they respond, you really know where your relationship stands. Um, I know there are plenty of times in my own personal life where I've said, I expected to hear from you and I didn't. And, um, and someone said, a friend said, you know what? You're right. I did not show up for you when your grandfather passed, but you sat Shiva with me when my fat passed and you stopped by the house several times. Right. I'm sorry. You know, I had just had a baby and, and I was going through a lot of different things. She was going through a lot of different things, right? And she just wasn't attuned to what I needed at the moment. It doesn't make her a bad friend. It makes her a person who was inundated with her own life. And her response made her friendship, made the, the friendship valuable to me. If she had said something very different, maybe that friendship had run its course. Maybe the season was over. Maybe that means that I need to take a break. Don't know. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because I think again, you break a leg, totally different. People don't handle that. But when it's deeply emotional, people just have different emotional interiors. You can't really make assumptions about somebody's emotional interior. That is where the proximity needs to become intimacy, and intimacy tells you how somebody navigates in that space, right? And so I, I, I really appreciate this part of the conversation because I do think that when you're talking about emotional and psychological abuse in particular, but all types of abuse, that the support systems really do matter. Um, and I do believe that you heal in the space of your relationships with other yeah. people. So that you, you won't know how much you're progressing until you literally put your body into it and you apply this in your real life. And sometimes that application is tough because if you're going through it and you're, and you're in the heat of whatever your bout is, the heaviness of it is, oh my God, I'm dealing with this huge thing and then I have to tend to all of these things outside of me. And so, you know, I want to honor those who go through these kinds of, of bouts as well because it is extremely difficult to articulate to people around you what's going on. I remember when I first started to realize what was going on with me with all these things, I said to everybody around me, no, it's not, I, it's, I don't feel great. This is this is not me, like... You know, my attic was full. I had no clue, clue. Stuff was just flying out, just flying all over the place. And I was like, what is this? What? And, and everybody, of course, they knew me in a certain frame. So it was like, you're fine. You look good. Your hair's nice. Your nails are done. What, what's the problem? Like, I don't understand what the problem is. Why? 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 And I'm like, I, I, I'm not sleeping. I, I, I have a loss of appetite. Like, I don't want to watch lacrosse anymore. Like, April not wanting to watch lacrosse, that, that is like a federal case, right? So it's like, if all of these things I love to do, I don't want to go to Brooklyn Yoga anymore. I don't want to, it's like, hello, it's, it's red flag time. But mm -hmm. that's your journey. But then having that conversation with the people around you, how do you form a support network around you while you're going through that around mental health is a totally different ball game. And I yeah. think that we're going to have to talk about more because Frankly, so many of us are dealing with it in multiple ways, right? We're, we're dealing with it directly. We're dealing with it indirectly. A lot of the addictions that we see are about us dealing with it indirectly, right? A lot of the ways in which folks are doing like yoga and working out and all these other things directly 
kind of indirectly, you know, and then folks who were, well, I should go to a therapist or I use my friends as therapists or, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like they have an understanding that something is wrong. They talk about it over and over and over again. And so either we are in a space where we're kind of like, okay, well, that is what that person does. That's their personality. Or we're in a space where it's like, hmm, this person I love repeats this story often. It's not a good story. They don't seem happy to me. Hmm. Okay. You may have a conversation with somebody in that sacred circle of care. Are you concerned about this? What's going on? Hmm. I don't know. Like maybe we should do well. And, and people are going to respond from whatever, from, you know, zero to whatever age they are to what they're used to. That's their business. That's just who they are. You know, they're crazy. They're this, that, they're that, but yeah. No, how do you find the space to hold space to be like, okay, we talk about this a lot. I just want to check in with you. You know, what's going on? Is this something you want to deal with? You want to confront it? If not, maybe we shouldn't talk about it as much <laughs> because I don't necessarily enjoy the conversation. But, you know, how do we start to have conversations where it's like, might be, you know, you could probably use a conversation with a therapist or maybe a life coach or just a counselor or maybe go to a support group because you're not alone and you seem to be stuck or you seem to be flailing and have that be something that's normative because we wouldn't watch a neighbor or a loved one, you know, with a backache for any number of years and say nothing. Or, you know, if, if somebody broke an ankle and it was turning purple, we wouldn't go, it's not a big deal. That's just who they are. We would say, go get something, go get help for that, right? Yeah. So uh, when <clears throat> there's a certain level of acceptance that everybody's not going to be where you are and navigating that, right? But then thinking about how I'm coming out of therapy for emotional and psychological abuse and I'm trying to navigate the kind of relationships that I want going forward because I don't want to repeat this pattern. So what do I do with the relationships that I have and then what do I do with the relationships that I want to create? Well, one of the things you do with the relationships that you have is be honest about your experiences and be honest when you're going through something that they may or may not understand. Try to give them as much, um, as much data as you possibly can so that they understand it, knowing that, that they're not going to have the same emotional experience as you. They're important people in your life. You'll want them to be able to care for you in the best way possible. If you are somebody who's caring for a friend or family member who has an abuse history, um, the work is not on all on the survivor. You can ask, what's the best way to care for you here? I had um, an experience with a friend um, who is in public health. And I called her because I was having a dilemma and I wanted to run through the dilemma with her. And I said, hey, I wanna, I wanna tell you about a situation. It's, it's sort of a problem and I just wanna get your, and I just want, you know, I just wanna hear what you have to say. And she said, okay, one second. Are you venting or do you want help? Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think both, right? It stopped me. It stopped me and I was so grateful. I was so grateful that my friend and sorority sister Asha stopped and said that. So do, what do you need? She was essentially saying, what do you need right now so that I can care for you in the ways in which you think you need support? Now I could be off. I could say I want to vent and then end up saying to her, well, what would you have done, right? Then that's really me asking for some consultation. But nonetheless, she put the ball in my court to say, I'm just venting. And I think that alleviates a ton of, of problems because sometimes, see my husband and I were just having this, this conversation in the car on, um, on Saturday, Sunday. Sometimes people don't need your consultation or your input. They just want you to listen. They don't need you to fix anything. Sometimes there is nothing to fix. Sometimes there's something to fix, but they will figure it out. They just need a space. They need a space created where they can uh, verbally vomit 
and not be seen as complaining or whining. They're just talking out loud. And you happen to be somebody listening. That's very different than someone who needs space and consultation. And it's very different than someone who is whining. Um, because usually whiners, that's a pattern, right? Yeah. And there's really no, no, every, a lot of times whiners will do what we call in, in psychology, yes, budding. So you'll say, well, what about this? Well, yeah, but I tried that. Well, did you think about this? Yeah, but it's just not going to work. Well, I did this when it happened to me. Yeah, 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 no, no. You know, so they're, they're sort of, they're deflecting at every turn. And it really, it changes the helper, right? Because they're just like, okay, well, you've done everything. So I, what else do you, I'll just listen. Right, it sort of it sort of incapacitates the the helper. So saying what you need, I think, is often really helpful. Also, making sure that you understand the person. If you don't know the person well, then you ask even more questions. So when I was starting to get to know you, I was asking you questions that may um, that I wouldn't necessarily ask a friend that I had known for fifteen years, right? Because I wanted to make sure that there was um, that there was. A, a bed of trust that I wasn't just gonna like fly by the seat of my pants and think that how I intervene with a friend over here is the same way that I would I would intervene with a friend over here. And even at one point I said something, I said, yeah, I said to you, let me know if this is okay with something that I had written and you mentioned you yeah. and you said, I trust you. And I said, no. Let me know if this is okay, because trust is very fragile with you, that's right. right? Like that, that's, so that's me, my attempt to say, I am attending to the needs that you may have, which are different from the needs that another friend has. And what you did in that moment also was to help me break a pattern and correct something that, you know, has, you know, given me some, a, a recovery of power. Right. Because that was very much a dynamic of, you know, the way that I kind of grew up and, and how I, it's like, okay, you, you just hand it over and then you deal with the fallout afterwards and, you know, whatever. And so that, that was that attention to like understanding my history and what you and I were doing together and like being very clear that the trust was so important and establishing the trust as a foundation was so important. It was like, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> right. It was, it was love in action, really. Right. It yeah. was respect in action. And I think that that's a thing. You know, the other part of this, you know, again, I'll get into mental health at, at some other point in the podcast. But I, I think a lot of this also in responses to people outside of watching relationships on multiple levels where emotional and psychological abuse is present is wanting to be at arm's length of it, but also there's a, an amount of judgment that comes along. I can't tell you how many men after this episode said to me, I, don't, I mean, I love Jason, but like, I, I'm not that kind of guy. Now, mind you, some of these people I know, and I'm like, interesting. I've watched some of the relationships that you were in, and there was definitely some emotional and psychological abuse in it on both sides. But because we're not aware of it and we're not talking about it and we don't have a language for it, you might not even know, notice that you're even doing it, right? Oh, and absolutely. so there's a certain level of, there, there's a, a percentage of the society that like wants you confront this, right? It's like, okay, enough, the attic is full, I wanna do this work. Then there's another part of society where like, I'm avoiding this at all costs. So if you bring it to me, you know, I'm, all of my guards are up. Right, because you're getting into a space that makes me profoundly uncomfortable, and then my response to it is to downplay it, to deflect, or to dodge it, or my favorite judgment. Yeah, and judgment is a killer, especially if somebody is in the heat of going through what they're dealing with with regard to any of these abuses, but especially emotional and psychological abuse because you can't really see it. So you're sitting there like, well, what? I mean, I don't understand what's, what's the problem, and so I'm trying to heal and I'm trying to to do all these things, but the judgment is there. I don't think people mean to do it. No, they, they, it, it, so it, it, no, we want to be different. We want to, do we want to say, I would never fall circumstance to that, 
because, right? You know, I would never be tricked into, into giving someone money over the internet because I know the signs. I would never be tricked into, you know, I would never be in a situation where a, a woman was, was being abusive towards me because I'm a man. Like, I can leave. I can be abusive back. Like, what kind of man has that experience? Um, and well, you're 100% right. Not only do men experience emotional and, and physical abuse, but they also, um, they were perpetrated as well. And it's not... It, it's it's there's a there's a there's an undertone an undercurrent to it that makes it almost feel like sometimes this is just our way yeah. this is just our way um an example of that is depending on your partner emotional withdrawal from them from them can feel like abandonment it can trigger so when you're upset and you don't speak to them for four days and you walk around the house not speaking and you're on the phone with other people laughing and joking and then get off the phone and you go back to the angry face, right? That emotional withdrawal can feel like abandonment. And that is manipulative. And manipulation is a part of abuse, yes, it is. right? Is somebody uh, attempting to abuse you? No, they're attempting to send the message that you pissed me off. But is that in the realm? Is it on the spectrum of what we do? All of us do. We all have our ways of expressing our anger. And some of those ways are not healthy. Is, is emotional withdrawal for an extended period of time. So it's one thing to take a break and cool off and come back and have a conversation. It's another thing to walk around and live with someone for days and not speak. Um, or purposely go out of, or not come home. You know, um, so that your your partner is left wondering. So, are you sleeping with someone else? Are you at work? Are you in, dead in a ditch? Like what? You, I don't I don't know. And you and you create this panic in someone else. That's manipulation, and manipulation is part of abuse. And we all have engaged in that kind of behavior. We just don't see it as abusive, but the recipient of it feels it, feels it, and they they might not label it as abusive. Um, any behavior that is purposefully hurtful oh, is yeah. aggression. Oh yeah. So much there. Um, so I want to, I always want to try to get to, you know, something gorgeous when we have these conversations, I want people to kind of leave with, I can do that. So when it's difficult for people to share with other people, I have a need you might not be able to honor it or fulfill it, but I need to speak it. You know, with all the clients that you've seen, you know because of your own life. It is amazing in the human condition how frightening it can be to literally look at someone that you love and care about that has a relationship with you that's deep and abiding and say to them, I need something you, you might not have the capacity of giving me, or I need to talk to you about something that is harming me that you were doing and I know you're not gonna get it. Or I need just this space to try to figure this thing out. And this is, this is a space where we're disconnecting. And even if that person wants to try to figure out how to reach you or do the work, the fear that comes up in trying to have that initial conversation keeps people in the cycle of like, you know what, I'm just gonna deal with the, the, the hamster wheel of this because I don't wanna do it. When you're talking to your clients and they're trying to make that hopeful move, like. I want to try to salvage this. You know, a lot of therapists are like, okay, do not engage when you're upset. Take a beat. Because when you're, you're in the monkey mind and, and when you're in the trauma brain of all of that, you're not speaking to the person. You're speaking to like their representative, their ego, their whatever. But how do you help people navigate those kinds of conversations where there's an upset and then there can be a recovery? Because mm -hmm. that's, that's the way to build resilience, right? So like, how are you teaching people to get those tools that they need to be resilient in this space? The first thing that I remind patients to do is to never make permanent decisions in the middle of a crisis. We are not talking about divorce in the middle of a major fight um, because your feelings are raw and they are intense and feelings detensify sometimes as time passes or with very small uh, behaviors that other people engage in or 
other people's words, feelings can intent can detensify or intensify. So we definitely don't make decisions when we are in the middle of a crisis. That's number one. Number two, um, sometimes I'll role play with patients, but I'll have them be the person that they're having to talk to. So, and then we'll switch. So I will be them and they, because they know the person that they're gonna talk to better than I do. I've never met that person. So that they know their defenses. They know that, okay, if I say this to my mom, she's gonna say, well, that's not what God says, right? You, you know, I know that's what she's gonna say. So instead of me trying to figure out what your mother might say when I don't know her, I have my patient play her mother and I pay the pay, play the patient. And we role play about how I would navigate if my mother said, well, that's not what God says. Or, you know, it's just just going to be uh, incredibly hard for the family to to navigate this you know this change in your life um so i role play and then we can switch and and sometimes and the patient can play uh self and i will try to, to throw some curveballs in but again keep in mind i don't know the person that they want to confront so it's hard for me to throw curveballs in that are specific to that person i can throw curveballs in though that they might want to think about um, so role playing is definitely when we get to that point where there's lots of trust in our relationship, then role playing sometimes is helpful. When when patients are struggling with having that conversation, I encourage them to communicate in many, many ways. Our silence communicates it. Mm. So at this point, my mom will say, so I guess you're just not going to say anything about that. Right, and it's because she said something that I don't necessarily agree with, or she's given me a suggestion that I should definitely take. <laughs> and I'm not doing it that way because I have my own r reasons and way of doing whatever it is we're talking about. And so she'll make the suggestion. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and, and so now at this point, it's been several years, she acknowledges my silence. My silence is communicating my, you know, I'm not, I'm certainly not angry, but after I've explained to you what I'm doing and why, and you want to tell me what is the best way or the right way to do it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for this rousing conversation. Right. <laughs> I'm going to go back to doing whatever I was doing it and why. Um, and so another thing that I suggest patients do is keep a video blog. So talk to your, just like a journal, uh, a video journal, talk to, turn on QuickTime Player, turn, you know, turn on whatever recording uh, pro program you have on your computer and just talk, talk like the computer's your friend, talk it out. Um, just like you would write it out. Some, some patients don't really like to write um, or writing takes too long or they have trouble articulating themselves when they write, but they can say it much differently. And some patients, the exact opposite. They, they enjoy writing. They want to write it down. They like to, re, to revisit later. Um, either way, you can revisit. You know, I, I encourage them to date the, the videos and, um, and keep them in a folder. Password protect the folder so you can go back to them. Um, and that often helps in many ways. Not only does it help to get out the energy. Some people are, 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 um, are psychological extroverts. So they, get, they get, like, they talk out things. Um, out loud and other people sort of do all the work internally and then and then spit out an answer but either way I think depending on who how you and try them all on I like to say that that there that coping skills are like genes um, very few people that I know but maybe it's just my people can can like buy a pair of jeans from a new brand that they've never tried on and just buy them and take them home right. they need to try them on because jeans have different cuts and a boot cut in one by one manufacturer is a different boot cut. It looks, it fits your body completely differently than another manufacturer. So you need to try them on. Take in, like, you know, so you take in two sizes of every jean that you want and you try them on. That's how coping skills are. Like try the video journal, try the written journal, um, try role playing, try whatever it is that you, you know, writing a letter um, and, and just try a conversation. You know what, here's the thing. Here's the important thing about having having these kinds of conversations. The the beauty is in the process, never the prize. So it really, and in some respects, doesn't really matter how your loved one responds. It would be wonderful if they responded well. 
But if they didn't, you still got a moment of advocacy out of it. You still got to find your voice with that person in that place. And whether or not they acknowledged or honored the fact that you had your voice and you found your voice and you used it doesn't mean that you didn't. Their response is on them. It's your job to engage the process. The process of saying what you need is saying what you need. Yeah. In whatever way, shape, or form you need, you can do that. That that's the process. Writing an email. I would I, I would I try to shy away from sending text messages around emotional stuff because and emails because you really can't get um, someone's emotional their emotional response and you also can't share emotion without using emojis unless you say something like I'm crying right now which feels very disingenuous but when you're talking to someone they would clearly get that data um, so I try not to I try to shy away from like texting emotional things, um, so emotional conversations. Thing is one thing to say like, oof, that was really hurtful. It's another thing to like have a 17 itemized lit text message, point itemized text message of, of all the things that you did wrong in the last six months. Um, so yeah, but there, there are lots of ways that you can communicate what you need. The, the, the beauty in it is the process of communicating what you need. Hopefully the outcome will be great. If it's not, that's like anything else in life. We try, we try to take a course, the outcome isn't great, we take it again. Yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, you know, in, in closing, I wanna figure out two things. One, what is the upside of this work? I mean, I've been in the work for a long time, but I want us to offer encouragement to cycle breakers and survivors because this is daunting, right? Like, nobody wants to do this work. Nobody wants to face this. This is, this is tough stuff. And, and the thing about it is, you know, you may start, you may feel good for a year or two, and then all of a sudden, year six, it's like, I thought I dealt with that. And it comes, mm -hmm. right? And so there are a lot of people who are not sort of engaged in it, and they, they kind of see it as like, okay, if I take this pill, I feel good in that moment. Or if I do this activity, I feel good. But you, you mean to tell me I have to do something where there's not going to be you know, an instant fix and I have to apply it and I have to do this really tough work of like rewiring my brain and also my, my physical responses to things that, that cause me pain and trauma. Like guide us through, you know, in, in, in a brief way, what it feels like to accomplish that and to kind of be able to move through that and apply it. And even if you gotta go back to get another, you know, tool for your tool belt, like what it means to have the tool belt in the first place, but then to just be like, oh, well, instead of this, you know, flathead, I now need a Phillips, but I can get the Phillips because I have a flathead. So I think the most rewarding part of the work is that you'll feel like your most authentic self and you'll, you'll have, you'll be able to operate in a, in an optimum health space, um, or at least a more optimum space than you were um, before. I think that people often feel, however you come to get your, um, your, your, your healing, I think people get different, different responses from it. They get different things out of it. For some people, it's just a relief. For other people, it's, um, it's a peacefulness in their lives. For some people, it's, frees up room, mental room for you to do other work with other people. That is, you know, it re really varies. I can tell you that most of life is about maintenance. We start something and there's a pointed time and place where we start it. And we end something and there's a pointed time and place where we end it. Everything in between is about maintenance. So I think that doing this work can be exhausting, but that's no different than doing anything else. When you get to a certain level of health, you have to maintain it. That means maybe that you go back into treatment after a few years. That means maybe that you find new coping mechanisms because the ones that you're using may have been um, maybe just worn out a little bit or they need a break. It's just like a, you know, I, as you probably can tell, I, I use analogies a lot in treatment. 
Um, most women know that you cannot have one pair of black shoes. Because if you wear, if you have one pair of black pumps, then you will be probably done with that pair in three months. Because black pumps go with a lot of things. If you have more than one pair of black pumps, then you can rotate them and both shoes will last like a little bit longer. If you have three pair, or four pair, that's how coping mechanisms are. Right? If all you do is like crossword puzzles, that's great. But at a certain point, your, your mind may, may tire of that. And then what do you have? So the goal is to build up your toolkit so that you have good coping mechanisms that you can rotate and use for different problems. Every coping mechanism doesn't address every problem that you have. Mm -hmm. Okay, and always my last question, what is your personal anthem right now and why? Um, I'm living my best life. Mm. That's it. Just yeah. um, people who are, you know, I, everything, there's a season for everything. So um, I am now embracing the fact that I always knew there was a season for everything. I think as people, we try to hold on to seasons, right? I love the summer. I would like to hold on to the summer through December 24th. And then as soon as January 1st hits, I would prefer the summer to come back because I'm a summer baby and I love warm weather. Um, uh, but that's not how life works. And I think right now, living my best life and um, embracing that the season is ending, whether that's a season on a friendship um, or any type of relationship or something I'm doing, that season is ending, but there's beauty in winter, there's beauty in fall and there's beauty in spring. I might really, really have loved the season that I was in, but it doesn't mean that there's not beauty in the other seasons and that I, don't, I won't enjoy myself there. But I'm not gonna enjoy myself if I fight to hold on to summer. If I'm wearing shorts in the middle of January, then that's just not, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. I need to embrace the season I'm in. Yeah, I love that. Dr. Carter, thank you so much for this time with us. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about where people can find you, what you're up to that you want people to know about? Yep, you can find me on Facebook and IG at, 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 at Dr. LD Carter. Um, and I'm also on LinkedIn. You can also find the Institute for Healing at www.myiheal.com. Uh, you can reach out if, you are, if you're interested in uh, getting an appointment. And also we are based in Maryland and also be very, very kind to our healthcare workers, our food service workers, our educators, and our tech people, because this has been um, a very solid 16 months of uh, grueling, intensive work where we have really kept the country going. And we really need your patience because everybody is full and backed up and tired. Mm -hmm. That's a really good thing. It's, we talked about that at the top of the interview, just having compassion and empathy and patience right now as the world is opening back up. Everybody's kind of rushing to the finish line and you know, in the supply chain, we still aren't quite where we need to be. So definitely what Dr. Carter says has a lot of resonance for a lot of folks. Um, wanted to remind people that we, this work is important and an important part of it is our call to action. If you go to our website and you go to the engage page, you will find this Amplify America social card and you can fill it out. I have mine laminated because I'm nerdy like that. You can fill it out. There's a space for your social media name. You can talk about the issue. You can talk about the people who are doing great work. You can talk about the solutions. And then you can also talk about the actions that you will take as a volunteer to effectuate change in your community. That is the heart of what we do. Every issue is about you being empowered to do something in your community to make it better. Um, also, please support this work. Um, you know, it, Rome is not built in a day and this work is very difficult to do and it's co time consuming and it's costly. So if you have a love in your heart for what we're trying to do here, one, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Amplify America, um, support us financially, Venmo, Cash App at, at Amplify America. We also have a patron program through Podbean. Um, you can find that on um, Podbean, Amplify America. And we have gear that you can buy on uh, Bonfire Tees. All of that you can find on our website. Um, our next episode is going to be on domestic and intimate partner violence in Colorado. We have three phenomenal guests 
Ruth Glenn, who is the president of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, um, whose work is extraordinary. And she's been doing work on a national level for a very long time. And her story is exceedingly compelling. So I do hope you'll listen to that. Um, Ruth Andam, who is a philanthropist, a businesswoman, and also a domestic violence survivor, shares her story. And it's really, really powerful. And then Nicole Castile is the program director of the Rose Andam Center a center that was endowed by Ms. Andam to help victims of domestic violence in Colorado. So I hope you will give that a listen. And finally, your time is precious and it's valuable. And I really appreciate any time that people take time out of their schedules to do anything that supports the work that I'm engaged in and with the work that we're trying to highlight through wonderful people like Dr. Carter. So, so thank you so much for being here. And if you couldn't be here for watching it later and sharing it with other people, all of that matters. So thank you so much for Amplifying America and have a wonderful day.